With me is Paul Wachtel. Paul is a distinguished professor of the City College of New York and was a co-founder of the Society for the Exploration of Psychotherapy Integration and being a past president of that organization. Many know him for his influence in the psychotherapy integration movement, for instance, in his early efforts to assimilate insights from psychoanalysis, his original school of thought, and behavior therapy. His work has this rare quality of being theoretically rich without losing the sight of the pragmatical aspects of how to become a better therapist. So we're very happy to have you, Paul. Thank you. Delighted to be here. <laughs> so, you know, you started your career with a marked interest in psychodynamic theories. So can you tell us first, be, before jumping to the integration part, how did this decision to become a psychoanalyst go about? Well, I... Uh got my PhD in psychology at Yale, and at the time that I was at Yale, it was a very psychodynamic program. Uh, it isn't any longer, it's more cognitive behavioral now, but it was very psychodynamic. And that was, in fact, part of why I chose it. I, I felt that the psychodynamic point of view was the most comprehensive and uh, really dealt with human experience more broadly than any of the other theories. So I was eager to explore it. Well, it's interesting because uh, you talk about this, but then I know that uh, you, you then had this discovery of behavior therapy. I, I have heard you tell the story that uh, you were supposed to go to, a, I think it was a meeting or a convention when you were supposed to defend psychoanalysis, but when you started reading up behavior therapy in order to destroy it, you then found some interesting aspects to it. Yes, you, you have it exactly right. Uh -huh. that, that is exactly the way it happened. Yeah. Uh, in, uh, at, at that point, this was in the early 1970s. And at that point, psychoanalysis was still, uh, in most of the world and certainly in the United States, the dominant point of view. Mm -hmm. Behavior therapy was, at that point, a rather small movement that psychoanalysts were rather contemptuous of. <laughs> and uh, I lived in that world, and so... Uh, sort of absorbed that attitude, mm -hmm. was kind of dismissive. Mm -hmm. But I had had one experience at Yale that uh, in a way primed me more for um, having uh, a receptiveness, and that is um, John Dollard and Neil Miller, mm -hmm. who uh, were in a way among the very early pioneers of integration. Mm -hmm. So Dollard and Miller, um, John Dollard was one of the very leading um, experimental psychologists, learning theory. Uh, John Dollard, uh, no, Miller was. Uh, John Dollard was originally an anthropologist and sociologist who got interested in psychology. Both of them in the 1940s, and I think maybe even earlier than that, had been interested in psychoanalysis, had actually, must have been in the 30s because it was before World War II, mm -hmm. when most of psychoanalysis was located in Europe. They both went to Europe, got analyzed by some of the leading analysts there, and wrote a lot of work about the integration of not so much behavior therapy, because it hardly existed yet, mm -hmm. but learning theory. And psychoanalysis. And they had been my teacher's idea. Mm -hmm. So I was in that sense primed, but I still absorbed the general psychoanalytic atmosphere of dismissal. But mm -hmm. just as you described it, when I actually read more about it, uh, I saw two things that were interesting. One, that there was evidence for their helping people in ways that I felt I had to take seriously. And secondly, that although both behavior therapists and analysts thought that they were completely opposite in their points of view, 
I saw potential points of intersection. Mm -hmm. So that was what got me started in exploring possible integrations. Yeah, you know, uh, this is interesting because I know that you're also interested in writing about social issues and you've written about the integration of your uh, insights from psychology into racism and all these social areas. And I think you've actually made this connection, but if not, uh, I'm doing it for you in a way, that the different schools of psychotherapy sometimes portray the other schools in a slightly social issue way. So, for instance, as a psychoanalyst, there is this aggrandizement of the differences, maybe, the caricaturized uh, of the other. Uh, how do you feel your colleagues felt, and what was the main reaction when you started getting interested into behavior therapy, being a psychoanalyst yourself? When I first began exploring um, behavior therapy, I, I actually met with a quite negative response mm -hmm. at that point. Mm -hmm. It was really, uh, any, even people who had thought well of me up to that point began to <laughs> misjudge me. He's lost his way. I, I hadn't realized they, they thought, this guy is really off the wall. <laughs> but little by little, mm -hmm. uh, there was more receptiveness. Interestingly, I, I, I found in the beginning more receptiveness from behavior therapists wow. than from psychoanalysts. Mm -hmm. And I think the reason was when I first began speaking to behavior therapists, one of the things I did, and I, I went in, I was much, initially, much more frightened speaking to behavior therapists than to analysts, because <laughs> analysts I put in my home, and these were the other. Yeah, the strangers. Receptive because one of the things I would start when I spoke to behavior therapists, I, I would say, <coughs> have you ever done a really thorough behavioral analysis and seen very clearly the kind of intervention that would help the patient and tried to present it to the patient, gave the patient homework and exercises to do that would help them. Mm -hmm. And the patient would continually either misunderstand what you were saying or not do the things that you knew would be helpful to them. Mm -hmm. And everybody in the audience would nod, yes, yes, we all have had that experience. And I'd say, well, that's what analysts mean when they talk about resistance. Ah. Suddenly we had a common language to begin discussion. And you brought something that they needed in a way. Yes. Ah, yes. That's, so so that was the, you were actually welcome in that sense. Right. Ah. Right. Now I would say, you know, one of the things that ha one of the reasons I think for the receptiveness of behavior therapists and the non-receptiveness of analysts was at that time, I think it was because analysis was predominant, so there was the arrogance of the wealthy. Yeah. In a certain sense, the <laughs> yeah. arrogance of those who were on top. Mm -hmm. So analysts didn't want to be bothered by those other people. Yeah, who were just, Now yeah, yeah. the tables have turned. <laughs> and now cognitive behavior therapy in many parts of the world is actually um, And with it has come, with the dominance, has also, become, has also come the arrogance. Yeah. So that now it's often cognitive behavioral people who are dismissive of anything psychoanalytic. We're just at the point where whichever approach is on top, arrogance seems to go with that, dismissiveness. So now it's analysts who are more receptive to integrative thinking by and large. Though, of course, there are many exceptions on both sides. Yeah. And what about um, the influence that behavior therapy had on your thinking about anxiety and exposure? I know this was a big part of the influence in your work. Yes, this was, I think, one of the major shifts for me. Uh, as you know, psychoanalysts tend to talk often about interpretations mm -hmm. as their primary intervention. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, efforts to promote insight. Mm -hmm. And the problem that psychoanalysis, I think, has dealt with almost from 
the very beginning, has been a recognition that intellectual insight is not very helpful, uh, that you need emotional insight, but that that distinguishing between the two often is a matter of hindsight. Yeah. You know, we don't really know if it's emotional insight till you see whether the person has really changed. Mm -hmm. And it's not so easy to tell. And part of the problem uh, is that the, the notion of interpretation is, has many of the same limitations mm -hmm. as the overly cognitive versions of CBT have, mm -hmm. where it's too much the verbal declarative realm. Yeah. And I've increasingly come to think that a very large portion of the action in psychotherapy occurs more uh, in the implicit realm, yeah. in the procedural realm. Mm -hmm. And exposure is an instance of that. Mm -hmm. the, the impact of exposure is not through telling yourself, oh, look, I have stood on a, on a hot, looked out the window on a high floor, therefore there's no danger of heights. Mm -hmm. It's the sheer exposure, the, the, the physiological cues, the yeah. workings of the brain on automatic levels that are quite different pathways from just the purely verbal. The verbal helps to fill it, fill it out, and I spend most of my time, if you observe me in the room, I'm talking to <laughs> the patient, but I'm thinking of it in terms of exposure. Yeah. And so when I'm thinking of, for example, in, of interpreting, let's say, angry feelings or frightened feelings. You or, want to evoke this. Uh, my aim is to create those feelings in the room yeah. to enable the person to experience the feeling that was once viewed as forbidden and dangerous and through experiencing it have the change occur yeah. and it's not that insight doesn't matter at all but that it's in some way secondary or at the very least complementary i've always thought of your brand if you could call it of psychoanalysis to be quite experiential in a way I feel that uh, you have uh, a lot of uh, influence also from, uh, you know, emotion-focused therapy, the third wave of cognitive behavior therapy, that all of these trends uh, in psychotherapy converge in your work into all your, uh, your work, your, your strategies to be very experiential in nature. Would you agree with that? I think that's very accurate. And I think what's interesting also about that, because it's absolutely true, is that this is one of the instances where CEPI, the organization we were talking about earlier, mm -hmm. plays a very important role. Because really the place where I learned about these other approaches was particularly by attending CEPI meetings. You know, because I think just from reading the journals, we all read the familiar journals yeah. and we read the familiar people. But when you go to a CEPI meeting, you have an opportunity to see ways of working that you're less familiar with. Mm -hmm. And it's really there that I became most familiar with those other points of view. Yeah. And by the way, uh, making a connection now with your own work, you have written in the past that therapy can be harmed as much as by paying too much attention to the relationship between therapist and patient has too little attention. Could you elaborate on this idea? Yes, I think you know my emphasis on that comes from the way that my psychoanalytic point of view has increasingly been part of what is generally described as the relational viewpoint. Yeah. And there's a lot in the relational way of thinking that uh, converges with my own thinking. But one of the problems is that the, one of the very strengths of relational psychoanalysis is also a potential weakness. Mm 
And that is that relational analysts pay a lot of attention to what's going on in the room and using the relationship with between patient and, and analyst as the primary therapeutic effort in a way. Mm. Uh, and in, as an in, interesting incidental on that, uh, you probably know that the work of Franz Alexander on the corrective emotional experience sure. was uh, rather thoroughly dismissed by American psychoanalysts <laughs> for many years mm -hmm. for, I think, problematic reasons. And almost every branch of psychoanalysis has really rediscovered the corrective emotional experience, but they each give it their own separate name, mm -hmm. each branch. And relationalists often talk about things like new relational experience. Mm -hmm. And I, I believe that that is one of the very powerful sources of therapeutic change. But the problem is that people learn to discriminate their behavior and their experience in different contexts. So we can learn that in the room with my therapist, it is safe to be fully myself mm -hmm. and to express all of the parts of myself that in my life up till now I have kept out mm -hmm. and pushed aside. And when that happens in the room, the therapist sees it, experiences it directly, and feels I am really succeeding. I see the patient changing right before my eyes. Mm -hmm. The problem is that if you're not looking very carefully at the person's daily life experience, what you may not know is that the patient becomes more fully himself and is living more deeply and richly in the therapy room, but maybe isn't outside because other people respond to the patient differently than the therapist does. Yeah. So you really need to pay a lot of attention to what's going on outside the room as well as what's going on in the room. So even here, your behavioral influences play a role because behavior therapy, by definition, for many time, for a long time, has uh, emphasized this need for like homework and environmental exercises. So again, it plays in, right? Absolutely. Yes. No, I think yeah, I, I completely agree with that. That's interesting. You know, you're a respected scholar in psychoanalysis. I would like to ask you, why do you think in 2016 it's still important for young psychology students to read Freud? Well, I don't know for sure. I think it's always useful to have a broader point of view. So reading Freud and understanding the history of it has value. Mm -hmm. But for me, even more important than that is to understand the principles and the insights of psychoanalysis, which have evolved quite considerably in the many, many years since Freud's death. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't think it's so much reading Freud per se, mm -hmm. though that can be of value. I think more important is that the psychoanalytic point of view and the insights that it represents enable us to understand much more deeply the conflicts people feel, the range of feelings mm -hmm. that they are likely to be struggling with. I remember very, uh, very strikingly when I was learning behavior therapy from people I respected a great deal and still respect a great deal. One of the things that I noticed was there was a patient who came in because he was having a lot of trouble making connections with women and establishing relationships with women. Mm -hmm. And he was continually stumbling, being awkward, <laughs> doing things that sabotaged the relationship. And the behavior therapist kept working with him on behavior rehearsal and practicing and uh, whether it was there some anxiety, but never really examined whether he was deeply conflicted about whether 
he wanted to relate to women. This was yeah. in an era before homosexuality was as accepted as it is today. Uh-huh. But I, I live in a part of New York, Greenwich Village, where long before homosexuality was accepted elsewhere in the country and in the world, it was openly accepted in Greenwich Village. Uh-huh. And I happened, because I, w- I was going out to... Um, a behavior therapy institute to observe this case, which I saw through one way mirror. Mm -hmm. And so I knew what the person looked like. And I happened to see him one day walking in my neighborhood, hand in hand with another man. Ah. And it then was very obvious what I was already raising with the behavior therapists who were um, conducting this treatment. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That, that part of why he was having trouble connecting <laughs> was, that wasn't really who he wanted to connect with. <laughs> yeah, of course. But it was in an era when it was harder for him to openly acknowledge that. Yeah. And so the, my psychoanalytic side was able to see the indications of wishes and desires and experiences that otherwise you know, would would not be discussed. Whereas the behavior therapist had a much more sort of socially normative view mm-hmm. of motivation. And I think even to this day, that is the case, that one has a much fuller understanding of the wide range of potential ways of experiencing and desiring that human beings have if you've had psychoanalytic training mm-hmm. over and above other kinds of training. That's a really great story. Well, I'd like to ask you also, you know, the integrative movement has come a long way and uh, now many therapists more than ever identify themselves as integrative or eclectic. Uh, What, in your opinion, have been the victories of this movement over the years and what have been the long-standing disappointments, if any? Well, I I think it certainly does seem to be true that more and more therapists do think integratively and even identify integratively. Um, And that's, from my point of view, very much a a positive. Uh, I think where my disappointments would lie is in two places. One is that uh, I think... Still, although CEPI is a thriving international organization, I think it is still hard for many therapists who even are integrated to identify that way thoroughly so that more people tend to join psychoanalytic organizations or cognitive behavioral organizations. And I I would like to see CEPI grow still further because I think it's the home for many more therapists than yet recognize it. So that's one sort of disappointment. The other disappointment is what I alluded to before, that as cognitive behavior therapy has become more and more dominant, it has institutionally, with, by the way, many, many, many exceptions, so I don't want to be overly stereotyping, Mm -hmm. but institutionally, it has taken on the same kind of resistant arrogance that psychoanalysts used to have. Mm -hmm. And as part of that, there has developed a movement which I think uh, impedes intelligent integration, and that is a, a, a way of defining what are empirically supported treatments or what is evidence-based practice in a very narrow and sort of naive way that kind of has the cloak of science but actually does not have the spirit of science. Mm -hmm. So that's a disappointment. That that has not changed yet, though I I hope it will because I think there's beginning to be more questioning of it. Yeah, when I talked to John Norcross, I also had this feeling because we talked about the dominance of cognitive behavior therapy. And, you know, some cognitive behavior therapists I've talked to have alluded that, you know, this dominance is based on research because there is a lot more research on CBT. 
But at the same time, and speaking with Norcross, I mean, he reminds me that uh, there is so much more information about what's called the dodo bird verdict, and you know that there is really the relational components that also have been so well researched. That it's incredible that this research has not still had the impact that you would expect. Do you have a comment on that? Well, I th I think that this is simply power politics. Mm -hmm. Frank. Uh, I think that. Uh, cognitive behavior therapy is defending its turf, so yeah. mm -hmm. and it it has led to the propagation of research methodologies that become self fulfilling prophecies. Mm -hmm. for, for example, if you claim that you only will take seriously a research study in which the treatment has been manualized, mm -hmm. then by definition, you're saying no treatment that isn't a manualized treatment can even be considered to have empirical evidence supporting it. Yeah. So it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. It's not that there isn't a lot of evidence, it's that an enormous yeah. amount of evidence is being just written off. Yeah. I was going through your recommended uh, list for readings for your students in your therapy classes. Uh -huh. And you have their psychoanalysis, social psychology, cognitive behavior therapy, emotion-focused therapy. I was curious that, uh, to ask you, in your experience, do you find your students open to experience this multitude of information and worldviews? Or do they still generally stick to a particular school and then explore the others in a more cautious or shy way? Well, I, th I think in some way, one, one of the, the ideas that's helpful to understand how this works today is Stanley Messer's concept of assimilative integration. Mm -hmm. And what he is pointing to there is that almost everybody does have some particular starting theoretical position and that over time the integration comes through assimilating other ideas into that framework. Mm -hmm. Now, in the very process of doing that, the framework changes, so it hopefully mm -hmm. continues to evolve. But if, for example, in the program I teach in, uh, probably the majority of students come in and choose our program, particularly because it's one of the relatively few programs in the United States that still has a very strong emphasis on psychoanalytic thought. Mm -hmm. we, we teach other points of view as well, and I, of course, am a strong proponent in the program of thinking integratively. Mm -hmm. But the base from which most of our students start, tends to be psychoanalytic in terms of their mm -hmm. uh, kind of initial preferences and initial exposure. But I've noticed, even in the course I'm teaching right this semester, I can see an evolution in the students as they learn about other points of view, but learn it because it's in my class, it's taught in an integrative way from the beginning. So they learn about other therapeutic approaches like cognitive behavioral or third wave cognitive behavioral or experiential or family systems work. But they learn about it as it can fit with and complement a psychodynamic point of view. Mm -hmm. So they're, as they, they, you know, they're initially surprised at the compatibilities, but this is actually the moment in our semester where I'm beginning to see the students really get it and really <laughs> understand that these can fit together and make the work more comprehensive rather yeah. than watered down. Uh -huh. uh, yeah. yeah, you know, based on also what you're saying, I'd like to ask you about the typical idea now that you also you know teach and supervise uh, future psychotherapists, what is your uh, opinion about personal analysis? Because psychotherapy, uh, psychoanalysis has a big tradition of encouraging personal analysis. Do you have your own, in your own experience, do you see any particular difference between your students that have and have not been analyzed or just have regular therapy? Uh, 
Um, well, I don't think, from my point of view, I, I don't think it's essential that everybody be analyzed uh, in terms of having an experience of a particular therapeutic approach. I do think it's very valuable to have had some kind of fairly intensive psychotherapy experience mm -hmm. because I think it that does it does two things. First of all, it gives you an understanding of what it feels like to be at the other end of the process. And since our work includes very centrally one work of understanding the other person's experience, having sort of stood in the other person's shoes by having been a patient oneself, that helps a lot. So yeah. I think just knowing what it's like to be at the other end is really important. Mm -hmm. But also, I think having been through one's own intensive psychotherapy of some sort alerts us all to the aspects of ourselves that we've been kind of uncomfortable with, would rather not experience, would rather not look at. So I think it enables us to be more open to hear nuances in what the patient is communicating that we might otherwise miss. So I don't know that I would uh, advocate making it an absolute requirement mm -hmm. because I tend to be a little bit concerned when things become bureaucratized, mm -hmm. but I certainly strongly believe that it makes therapists uh, much better attuned yeah. to what's going on with other people. And I certainly don't see a lot of absolutes in your work, which I think is a, a very upside to it, of course. Well, in uh, 1980, you wrote an article titled Investigation and its Discontents. And since then, investigation in psychotherapy has come a long way and we've made some remarkable advances. Still, what in your opinion is still seriously under-researched in, in our field of psychotherapy? Well, I think in our field of psychotherapy, and this relates to some of what we were talking about a little bit earlier, I think there has been much too much emphasis on randomized controlled trials mm -hmm. that... Uh, are basically investigating some brand name package of mm -hmm. interventions. Um, and it's as much marketing as anything else. And what we know is, A, that many of these uh, therapies that have been validated through randomized controlled trials, again, apropos the dodo effect, if you compare them against each other, they do about equally well. Mm -hmm. So, it, you know, they're, they're, it's each person is trying to prove that their, their product is better. And the problem is that where we are in the history of our field is that we have some quite useful ways to be helpful to people. But if we're honest with ourselves, we certainly have a long, long, long way to go before people can come in to see us and leave with large clinical gains. Yeah. You know, often these randomized control trials show statistically significant differences, but not really huge clinical gains. And the problem is that the logic of those investigations means you start with an already existing package and you kind of freeze it till the end mm -hmm. because you can't change it in the middle or the study gets messed up. Mm -hmm. But there are ways now that we have available uh, audio taping and videotaping of sessions. There are all sorts of retrospective ways of finding you know, process studies and yeah. process outcome studies, mm -hmm. which can find ways, first of all, looking more at process than at a package, a brand name package, mm -hmm. so that we can see 
each therapist in using his or her own style, what are the fundamental underlying principles and processes that promote change, and when you do a retrospective process study or process outcome study, when you're looking in depth at a naturalistically conducted therapy, and you're looking for coherences and contingencies that were not seen with the naked eye, so to speak, by the therapist in the room at the time, but which can become evident when you watch the same video over and over again. That's the way we can learn new things. But it's become such a kind of validate the brand name kind of focus yeah. that the main emphasis in research is not really so much on learning new things as on trying to prove that what we already have is good enough. And most of the time what we already have is as good as we can get it right now, but uh, yeah. not really good enough. It does not sound like a good principle for science, I would imagine. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, I, the work of uh, Leslie Greenberg and even Carl Rogers and is more on this kind of process experiential side. Uh, would you then, are you saying that you'd like to see some more of that kind of research? I would like to see a lot more of that kind of research. Right. And Jeremy Safran is another person who's been doing those kinds of studies. Lots of people have. I don't want to just single out a couple of people. Lots of people have, but there is this mythical idea that a randomized control trial is the gold standard. Mm -hmm. And that's a phrase, as you know, that's often used. And it's fool's gold. Yeah. You know, there are many, there are strengths to randomized control trials. There are very, very important weaknesses. And unless you have the convergence of many different methodologies all together trying to bolster our knowledge, we're not likely to make a lot of progress. Yeah. And the problem is that, by and large, randomized controlled trials get much more attention, have much more prestige, by and large, in determining people's promotions in academic settings and so on, than, say, process studies or process outcome studies or a host of other methodologies. And I think that actually is, is impeding progress in our field. Yeah. Well, just to finish off and coming back to a more personal realm, I'd like to ask you, uh, what's the advice you wish you would have received when you were starting out as a psychotherapist? Ha, ah, that's a really good question. Um, have to think about that one for a moment. <laughs> uh, I guess this sounds a little bland, and so I'm going to be thinking even as I'm talking. <laughs> Go ahead. But, uh, you know, to not be too certain in the way you see things, the way you've been taught to see things, to uh, always be looking outside the frame of references that feel most comfortable. Uh, and in general, to be um, comfortable with discomfort. Mm -hmm. I think that's both what we need as psychotherapists, because we need to be living with and making room for the most uncomfortable experiences that our patients have. But also, we're only going to grow if we have a lot of discomfort, if we have a tolerance for discomfort. Yeah. We, because ours is a field. There are a lot of fields where you can achieve a certain amount of certainty. I mean, I remember even, for example, and I don't know whether the tax system in Portugal is as complicated <laughs> as in the United States. But it also gets problems, yeah. A lot of people in preparing their taxes go to an accountant, mm -hmm. you know, somebody who specifically understands the tax laws and helps you prepare your tax return. I remember having a discussion with my accountant who, oddly enough, loved, belonged to a, uh, a reading group that studied literature, mm -hmm. uh, fiction, novels, 
uh, that was conducted at the New York Psychoanalytic Institute. Yeah. And I remember asking him, this seems to represent a whole other side of you, because being an accountant is a much more, you know, you just plug in the numbers, you know something specifically, you, at the end of the day, you've, you've got the number and the return. And he said, that's exactly what he likes about being an accountant, that he, know, he says he doesn't understand, he's, he's fascinated with psychoanalysis, he's fascinated with psychotherapy, but he doesn't understand how somebody could do it every day because he feels, for his comfort, he likes to know that at the end of the day, he knows exactly what he did. He <laughs> defined precisely whether he did it right or wrong. He's got this little project, he does it, and the next day he's got a new project. Yeah. And indeed, psychotherapy isn't like that. In order to be a good psychotherapist, you really need a lot of tolerance for feeling you don't know what you're doing. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I think probably a third of my sessions, there are at least some moments where I'm thinking in one way or another, maybe I should have been a shoemaker. <laughs> you know? And I think if you can't tolerate that feeling, you're going to wash away all the ambiguity that is a very important part of what we need to be able to be open to to be effective psychotherapists. Yeah, so tolerate uncertainty and even invite it. Yes, mm -hmm. right. Well, Paul, thank you so much. It's been a really great pleasure talking to you. And, I, mm -hmm. and you're coming to Lisbon soon, so I hope to see you there. <laughs> yes, I will I will be uh, leaving, for, leaving for Lisbon this Wednesday, and I will see you, I guess, on, I think it's Saturday that I'm yes, doing. Yes, exactly. Workshop so, and we'll look forward to, to meeting you in person. <laughs>